This video is sponsored by Mubi, the wonderful members of my Patreon, and most importantly, by coffee. How many cups have you had this morning? None. Plus? Five, but yours is better. You have a problem. Yes, I do. One of my favorite sports is discussing Gilmore Girls. And I consider it a sport because you need quick reflexes, strong breath control, and the ability to take a lot of pain. If you're out on the road. The most grueling of all discussions is which of Rory's boyfriends do you think is the best? So I wanted to lay out my argument for why it is that Logan Huntsberger, the butt-faced miscreant himself, is the best boyfriend for Rory Gilmore. You jump, I jump, Jack. Or at least not the worst. Gilmore Girls was an American comedy drama television series created by Amy Sherman Palladino that starred Lauren Graham as Lorelai Gilmore and Alexis Bledel as Rory Gilmore, the mother-daughter duo that made up the titular Gilmore Girls. The show debuted in October 5th of 2002 on the WB and became a flagship series for the network, running for seven seasons and the final season moving to the CW, ending its run on May 15th, 2007. The show was a huge deal and every white girl I went to college with was obsessed with this show to the point where I was confused about not liking it. But then again, this was during the age of the CW where it was whitest broadcast network on earth. So. This is the WB. This is the WB Television Network. The network for young adults. This is the WB. Established and creatively strong series. This is the WB. WB stars and series continue to prove the night is young. Other than Charmed, I really did not see much for myself there. It was never a huge hit, but it was one of the most popular shows on the WB. And in 2016, it got a terrible four-part miniseries revival, Gilmore Girls, A Year in the Life, which streamed on Netflix. And I did a video about it way back when, before I was really popular. So if you wanna see my thoughts and opinions on that, they exist and um, I was right then and I am right now. Taking place in the fictional small town of Stars Hollow, the series dealt with Lorelai, a single mother who left her home as a pregnant teen mom and worked her way into a sense of solidly middle-class accomplishment. Her brilliant daughter Rory gets the opportunity to attend the private school Chilton, which will give Rory a better chance at attending her dream school of Harvard. How did this happen? You didn't with the principal, did you? No, honey, that was a joke. They have an open spot. You're gonna start on Monday. However, when the financial obligations become strikingly clear, Lorelai is forced to ask her parents, Richard and Emily Gilmore, for help. Wow, that is a lot of zeros behind that five. Emily and Richard are rich, rich, like old white New England money. Richard has a job no one quite understands and is never explained. And apparently their family came over on the Mayflower. But why don't they think I'm good enough? Rory. I mean, I'm a Gilmore, do they know that? My ancestors came over on the Mayflower. OG colonizers. Good for them, I guess. Emotionally distant from her parents, Lorelai humbles herself to get the money for Rory's school, which forces them to attend Friday night dinners with their estranged family. That is the core class conflict that the series will rotate around, especially as Rory herself is constantly pulled between her mother's world and her grandparents. I want a weekly dinner. What? Friday nights, you and Rory will have dinner here. Mom. And? You have to call us once a week to give us an update on her schooling and your life. There are a lot of characters in the series, but for the sake of this video, we will just run down some of the key players. You've already met the Gilmores, but then there is also Luke Danes, Lorelai's man-child love interest and overbearing asshole. I hate Luke. Hot take number one. Can't stand him. Think he's the worst. What are you doing? Back off! Come, come over here! What do you think you're doing? He started it. By doing what? He was coming in. Are you a lunatic? He's 16. Oh. Max Medina forever. Actually, Christopher. But again, I digress. There is Christopher, Rory's biological flighty father. Paris, Rory's rival turned best frenemy. Move, move, move. Is it raining? No, it's National Baptist Day. Tie your tubes, idiot. Lane, Rory's childhood best friend and token Asian character who really doesn't get to do as much as she should because the show is very racist. And then there are Rory's major romantic love interests throughout the series, Dean, Jess, and Logan. 
all of them have gone on to do huge things as actors, so good for them. Oh, and there's also Suki, the chef who works at the Dragonfly Inn and is Lorelai's best friend. And again, is another character that should have more consistently to do, but doesn't. Even though Liz McCarthy is great in the role. Before getting into the romance angle of it all, which will click on my critical brain, I want to just highlight that I think Gilmore Girls is a really good show, mostly. The writing is strong, the humor and physical comedy are excellent, and I don't think anyone else could play these characters the way that they do. Lauren Graham should have absolutely won an Emmy for playing Lorelai. She is brilliant, charismatic, like really giving you like, Carol Burnett levels of physical female comedy. It's really a tour de force role. Despite the class, race, and body issues, I do think this show elevated the type of programming that was on the CW dramatically. It tried to say something and delivered a co-lead in Rory, who is a ambitious, driven, flawed, and deeply loved teen character. Much like Hermione Granger and Daria, I can see why people really lean into these characters and put them on a pedestal. I would say the big difference between Rory and the other two is that Rory is written to be perfect and Daria and Hermione are not. Mostly Rory and Lorelai were fun characters and even when I absolutely hated them, I loved the world they were in. And I knew that this story was only possible through their lens and that's saying something that I really can't say about some of the other leads in Amy Sherman Palladino works because I hate Midge Maisel, but Rory, Lorelai are iconic characters in television. Gilmore Girls is a fantastic show and it definitely deserved a lot more when it was on. And because it didn't, now we have to deal with Midge and Mrs. Maisel. So you reap what you sow. Hi, mom. Rory. Prodigal daughter, fellow sister soulmate. What are you doing back from college? We all have dirty laundry in our past. As it turns out, mine is in my present. With that out of the way, let's get into the romantic politics of this video. Feeling lonely and so cold. In narrative, there are characters called foils. Foils are characters who contrast another character, usually the protagonist. For a bard example, you have Macbeth and Banquo. Both are visited by the Weird Sisters and told a prophecy of greatness, but Macbeth uses that information to gain more power and Banquo doesn't. It is implied that if Macbeth hadn't tried to win the throne through treachery, he might have gotten it without the whole regicide stuff. In Gilmore Girls, each of Rory's boyfriends serves as a foil to her in some way. Her first boyfriend is Dean, played by Sam from Supernatural. You're like Ruth Gordon, just standing there with the tannis root. Make a noise. Rosemary's baby. Yeah. Well, that's a great movie. Dean is not a huge reader the way Rory is, but initially is depicted as enough of a reader to appreciate Rory's intellectualism. They will destroy his character for the sake of Jess very quickly. Last Friday, these two guys were tossing around a ball and one guy nailed the other right in the face. I mean, it was a mess, blood everywhere. The nurse came out, the place was in chaos. His girlfriend was all freaking out and you just sat there and read. I mean, you never even looked up. I thought, I've never seen anyone read so intensely before in my entire life. I have to meet that girl. He is tall, handsome, athletic, has a lot of the trappings of a popular boy. When Lorelai first meets Dean, she comments that he reminds her of Christopher. Where this resemblance comes from, I have no idea. Maybe Lorelai has white man blindness the way I do. One of the things you can note is that as soon as Rory meets Dean, she has doubts about transferring to Chilton, showing that her attitude of shifting to align with a partner is not entirely a Logan thing. If you'd had plans, I would have known. How? Well, you would have told me. I don't tell you everything. I have my own things. Fine, you have things. That's right, I have things. Hey, I had dibs on being the bitch tonight. Just tonight? What the hell is wrong with you? I'm not sure I want to go to Chilton. What? The timing is just really bad. The timing is bad? And the bus ride to and from Hartford, it's like 30 minutes each way. I can't believe what I'm hearing. Plus, I don't think we should be spending that money right now. I mean, I know Chilton's got to be costing you a lot. Oh, you've no idea. All of your money should be going toward buying an in with Suki. What about college? What about Harvard? We don't know that I can't get into Harvard if I stay where I am. Okay. 
Enough, enough of the crazy talk, okay? I appreciate your concern, but I, I, I have this covered. I still don't want to go. Why? Because I don't. I have to get out of here. Dean is a working class kid. He doesn't have the long-term dreams for college that Rory has because he doesn't have rich grandparents who will foot his bills. He works for a living. In fact, we see him getting a job that he will keep throughout the majority of the series because he has to work for a living. He may not be as down on his luck as later love interest Jess, but Dean is someone who comes from a solidly working middle class background. In many ways, Dean has become derided for his temper, but I think people are often quick to paint any emotion from a young teen boy as toxic. I don't think Dean is toxic. I think he's just an emotional guy and he's emotional about his partner, but not in an unhealthy, toxic way, but in a my partner is an asshole and won't communicate to me kind of way. Hello, Editor Princess here. So as I was going through the edits for this video, I realized that I didn't fully explain why I don't dislike Dean based on his actions while calling them out substantially. So I wanted to take a minute and uh, explain what I mean in sort of better terms. The big issue I've, I have with the way that some people talk about Dean really goes down to my feelings about the term toxic masculinity. Like toxic masculinity is a very particular thing and discussing the entitlement that comes with men who, with especially cis men who grow up socialized male and within the patriarchy. And I think when you have a show that is very protagonist morality centered, it wants you to take the side of the protagonist, even in situations where the protagonist may be incorrect or may be a little bit more emotionally complicated than it is. With Dean, I have always found that while his up anger and upset at Rory not saying I love you back was childish and immature, the context is this is a 15, 16 year old boy who was being very emotionally vulnerable and got his heart broken. And, you know, he didn't act like he was upset and it showed and it was a big upset. But I don't think that is bad. I think that there is a sense that, you know, especially because Rory is this sort of like, you know, demure little figurine, you know, they very much lean into her whiteness. In, in that sort of like whiteness fragility. And we're supposed to be like, uh, you know, scared for Rory whenever Dean, who is this taller, bigger figure, is acting in this big way. But he is expressing just his frustration and the fact that this sort of would have come out of nowhere. You know, sort of Rory's issues with her father are not something that I feel are properly established to make this sort of make sense, especially with how underwritten and weirdly constructed Christopher is as a character. And I think even if I take that moment and it frustrates me about Dean, the thing that I that makes me side with him, even when he's fucked up, is that the writing is so very much biased against him as the series progress. Um, it reminds me a lot of Laurel in Arrow, actually, because if you watch the first season of Arrow, Laurel is depicted very competently. She's a fighter. She is shown to be engaging in combat and is like a powerful figure. And she gets completely neutered in the second and third seasons of Arrow because the test audiences preferred um, Felicity. And so that led to her character being really screwed over. Following season two, there is this very heavy classist element in how Dean is treated. And while at the beginning, especially in contrast to Richard and Emily, we're supposed to see Rory and Lorelai as like defending him. You know, he's the everyman, rah, rah, Dean. But as soon as Rory goes to college, you see that same, all the things that Richard brings up in that conversation in that clip I played earlier, are the exact things that play a role in why Rory doesn't want to be with Dean in the end, which is on one level totally fine, but they sort of circumvent the class element. And what's so frustrating is that we have Luke, who is the only long-term working class character in the show, 
And he is never on Dean's side. He instantly sees Dean as this antagonistic force. And it's weird for him to have a rivalry with A, a 16 year old, but a 16 year old who was the closest to him in class, um, on class level, he feels antagonistic towards and wants Rory to date better. And yet when that same thing could be passed on to him, we're supposed to be like, it's different. And it sucks because Dean is, you know, he works three jobs. He is doing the work. He's a decent guy. He's not perfect, but he really got gaslit. Like, I think if you think about what gaslighting means and the manipulation, like he absolutely was gaslit, gay kept, girl boss by Rory, like a thousand percent. And it's disappointing that that so often gets ignored, but him being angry in response to what is for the majority of season two and three clear gaslighting gatekeeping girl bossing is something that I always find funny because it's so blatant but the problem is that Dean loves Rory more than Rory loves him an issue that will become more and more apparent throughout the series exploration of their relationship it is also pretty much ignored that Rory emotionally and physically cheated on Dean. All of the moments in which he acts badly are in response to the very clear and unsubtle ways that she's trying to hide her crush on Jess, which is her emotionally cheating. And she's absolutely a jerk for that. And when Dean moves on, gets married, Rory then uses Dean as a crutch for her emotional issues. When they end up getting back together after the affair, it's made very clear that it's not just that they have different schedules, is that Rory actively looks down on Dean for being working class. Unfortunately, the series sends a mixed message. On the one hand, the very relationship between education, class, and cultural capital is consistently questioned throughout the series. Characters like Paris, Logan Huntsberger, and the Springsteen family are presented as deeply flawed, while Lorelai and Rory truly embody cultural capital. Still, with the exception of just Mariano, characters who are less formally educated and or come from lower class backgrounds tend to have less cultural capital. Thus, no matter how much Gilmore Girls writers want us to believe that Rory and Lorelai have cultural capital in spite of their circumstances, the very fact that the duo maintains ties to elite culture throughout the series reinforces Bordeaux's point that cultural capital is an advance of the privileged. So Dean, uh, Grandpa? you do know that Rory's going to an Ivy League school. I know. Harvard, Princeton, Yale. Said he knew, Dad. You need top grades to get into a top school. Yeah, well, Rory's really smart. Yeah, she is really smart. Mom, yeah, why don't we all go sit in the... So, uh... how are you planning to make a living once you graduate from this college you haven't thought anything about yet? This family has standards. You live up to them, and you should expect that everyone you spend time with live up to them also. You are a gifted girl with immense promise, and you should learn very early that certain people can hold you back. Grandpa, stop it. You cannot treat Dean this way. Well, this is a very nice spread you've assembled here. <laughs> well, when you're dating an Ivy League girl, you have to pull out all the stops. Chip pieces? Yes, please. <laughs> I'm glad we got to do this today. Me too. We haven't been able to see each other much lately. Well... We're here now, right? Yeah, right. Hey, did you ever read my story? Which story? The one about the Life and Death Brigade. Uh, yeah, I did. You like it? I did like it. I, I like everything you write. Do you think I painted the picture interestingly enough? Because I tried to be objective to a certain extent, but it is a feature piece, so I wanted to have some human spark, you know? I thought it was good. Nothing specific, though? Uh, hey, you're the writer. I can't critique these things. I just know that I read it, and I was interested. Well, that's what counts. Dean, hi. I'm sorry, have you been waiting long? I didn't have a watch, and we were in the pool house. These are some friends. They go to Yale with me, and they know my grandparents. The party was so boring, so we... Is that a new shirt? I like it. What am I doing here, Rory? You're picking me up. I don't belong here. Not anymore. Do I? Do you? 
You look good. And it's because she's not emotionally tied to him anymore, which is fine. You can outgrow your partner, but you know, say something. Like the junk food she consumes, Dan is her comfort food and she digests him and shits him out as quickly as she can. All you have to do is Jess is absolutely the most popular boyfriend of Rory's because he's the smart bad boy. And also, yes, the actor is very hot. He challenges Rory and is the first person who pushes her outside of her comfort zone. We also find out during their courtship that Rory's into Ayn Rand. So thanks for bringing up that red flag, Jess. Uh, good looking out. 10. 10? Yeah, but I didn't understand a word of it. So I had to reread it when I was 15. I've yet to make it through it. Really? Try. The Fountainhead is a classic. Yeah, but Ayn Rand is a political nut. Yeah, but nobody could write a 40-page monologue the way that she could. For the Jess and Rory relationship, despite the ways that Rory wanted to commit to Jess, he was just not emotionally ready. He had this massive chip on his shoulder due to the abandonment issues surrounding his mother and father. Issues that sort of never really felt fully explained, especially when we meet Liz his mother, and she is absolutely nothing like the horror show just describes. She's essentially a wackier, blonder Lorelai. And it's a, it's a separation of reality from, from what we've been told narratively that I never forgot. And it's one of the things that Gilmore Girls does a lot. They will tell you a lot of times that these characters should be read a certain way, but when they appear, they are inherently and often much more sympathetic than they were supposed to be perceived. And it leads to a really huge disconnect for me as a viewer because I'm being told to dislike a certain character and then I meet them and I'm like, this is more complicated than that, which is basically my entire essay about why I like Christopher despite him being very unpopular. Throughout the relationship, Jess fails to communicate, actively keep secrets and allows his pride to stop him from actually growing in the relationship he was in with Rory. What is your problem? You're not telling me the truth. That's my problem. I don't want to get into it here. And it's obvious why. Oh, is it? You got into a fight with Dean. Unbelievable. Is that it? It always comes back to Dean. Because you bring it there. You brought up Dean. Because you got into a fight with him. Why are you pressing this? Why? I'm trying to make some kind of quasi-positive impression on your grandmother per your request. And you're forcing me to do otherwise. And what the hell are raisins doing in a salad? Why can't people leave well enough alone? These two flops really love each other, but Jess is jealous and possessive, and Rory is used to being the alpha in her relationship, of being adored and having a partner who tries to anticipate her needs. Jess isn't like that because he has his own needs that need to be addressed. This isn't to say that the failures in their relationship are one-sided, but I think with every relationship, we are supposed to ultimately side with Rory. She's our star child, and the fact that Jess is unable to grow is framed as his failure, even though Rory is also floundering in this relationship. And even the aspect of cheating doesn't change, since as soon as she has drama with Logan, she uses Jess to get emotional, satisfaction from him and then drops him. This, it's not fair to you. I'm such a jerk. I, I don't know what you're talking about. And I couldn't even cheat on him the way he cheated on me. Who? Who cheated on you? That guy? Oh. You're still with him. She is consistently a bad partner. Now, when people say they love Rory, most of the time they're talking about pre- college long hair Rory. Before college, Rory was the more practical and reasonable part of the Gilmore Girls duo. But then she goes to Yale and pays someone $20 so that she could sit under one particular tree. And Rory just becomes so ridiculous that Lorelai actually needs to parent. The later seasons also expose something that is very key about Rory as a character. She is a snob. I'm a Gilmore, do they know that? Class in the show is a mess, but one of the things that defines Lorelai, at least on paper, is that she is not attached to the fancy rich life she grew up in. I think responsibility and paying your bills and dealing with reality is important. Uh, well, I'm beginning to learn about reality. I grew up with a lot of privilege. Right, you had that whole silver spoon in the mouth thing, and that's not how I raised Rory. I know that. This was not a silver spoon household. This was Spork City, all the way. I get that, and I respect that, because I just spat out a whole place setting of strolling silver royal Danish. I left my dad's company. I left that world because I had my own values. I understand that. I thought you would, because that's what you did. 
You left the world a privilege to do things your way. I guess I never thought of it that way. And you did it when you were younger and had a baby to take care of. I know, it was really impressive. I don't need you to be impressed by me. I just need you to know it wasn't easy. I know that. I didn't get anything like, boom, you know? I worked hard for everything I got. In order to understand how Gilmore Girls contributes to the broad public discourse about classlessness in contemporary America, the representation of the series' ambiguously class protagonists must be analyzed in relation to both these material and cultural markers of class. Because this show distorts class categories, overemphasizing their symbolic qualities, taste, lifestyle, Lorelai's class membership is performed with an ambiguous freedom. Her symbolic displays of class affiliation, including her knowledge of popular culture, cosmetic eccentricities, and absurd junk food eating habits make her appear ordinary in terms of approachability and connection to the real world. Economically, she acts as though she can shed the privileges of her wealthy upbringing and embody the image of an autonomous self-made entrepreneur. However, her allegiance to a poverty of choice rather than necessity and upward mobility, which is often achieved off screen such that the audience never sees the type of labor involved with this process, obfuscate the recognizability of her class membership. This performance distracts from the possibility that she could be part of a broader social class or engage in class solidarity. In comparison, Rory is someone who loves being part of that world. Is it weird and uncomfortable at times? Absolutely. But Rory loves being in places where she can excel and be someone who epitomizes excellence, unlike her mother. Part of that is being a Gilmore and coming from that family tree. Chilton Prep was filled with rich kids, but it was a much more academic driven setting. And it says a lot that her biggest rival was Paris, someone who was exceptionally intellectually gifted and their conflict was about that mainly. And we choose to ignore Tristan because who even was he? Yale, however, is a new level because unlike at Chilton where Rory was admitted because of her grades and academic talent, a part of why Rory is in Yale is because she's a legacy, period. Doesn't discount that she is smart. We, the audience, know that. Even though she didn't realize that you need extracurriculars for Ivy Leagues. When you apply to an Ivy League school, you need more than good grades and test scores to get you in. Every person who applies to Harvard has a perfect GPA and great test scores. It's the extras that put you over the top. The clubs, charities, volunteering, you know. Oh yeah, I know. However, the Gilmores being at Yale goes back generations. Her family donates there. She is the granddaughter of multiple alumni. This is about Rory and Rory's education, which frankly, Lorelei, is something you know nothing about. Excuse me? You never went to college, let alone an Ivy League college. You don't know the first thing about the system, the way it works. I do, I went through it. You want Roy to go to Harvard that badly? Well, so do thousands of other mothers. Yale is an excellent school, the equal of Harvard in every way, except one. I went here. I'm an alumnus. That makes it easier for Rory to get in. And if you had any idea about the way the system works, you'd know this. Her getting in was all but secured for the moment she was born. That kind of wealth, privilege, and expectation of excellence is not something that Dean or Jess could understand or live in. But you know who does understand that? Logan Huntsberger. This video is brought to you by Mubi, a curated streaming service showing exceptional films from around the globe. Mubi is a curated streaming service, a place to watch beautiful, interesting, incredible cinema. Every day, Mubi premieres a new film from iconic directors to emerging auteurs, and there's always something new to discover and something very niche that will fill that film lover in you. With Mubi, each and every film is hand-selected, it's your own personal film festival, and it's streaming anywhere, anytime, and it's really got a lovely collection of things. Like, as a cinephile, I finally feel like I've unlocked an achievement by finally get to offer you all a Mubi deal. Like, I love this site. I have used it many times because I love just the idea of finding more different kinds of cinema. Like I try to really live at the hashtag of watch more movies. I have been trying to broaden my film education, especially as somebody who often uses film theory terms, but didn't go to film school. I want to make sure I'm not telling you guys bullshit. I want to make sure that y'all don't sh get shaded on the streets because I told you the wrong thing. Um, and for me, I really love the reframing female director's collection with spotlights, films from directors, female directors all over the world. And, you know, I figured Gilmore Girls is a show that's all about its pop culture references, all about its quips. I mean, 
Dean and Rory meet and bond because of a Rosemary's baby uh, quote. Because if Rory and Lorelai were gonna have a fancy streaming service, it would be movie. There were so many films that I really found a connection to and I'm so glad that I got to watch it and check it out and talk to the people at movie and coming up with this app so that you guys could know that I actually, you know, care about these things. So you can try a movie free for 30 days at movie.com slash princess weeks. That's M U B I dot com slash princess weeks K E S. Thank you very much for a whole month of great cinema for free. And I highly recommend it. If you want some suggestions for films streaming on movie in the US. And now let's go back to following the Gilmore girls where they lead us. When we first meet Logan, he is an asshole. He is a prankster. He calls Rory Ace a sin many can't forgive. Me, I'm into it. Master and Commander. The movie? No, that's what I want you to call me from now on. He is just the epitome of privilege. However, unlike most of the rich people we see on the show, he knows his advantages in the world and doesn't pretend otherwise. He is immature and Rory knows that fully when they start going out. He tells her that he's not, quote, a commitment kind of guy. You are beautiful, you are intelligent, you're incredibly interesting, you're definitely girlfriend material. I, however, am definitely not boyfriend material. I can't do it, I can't do commitment. I don't wanna to pretend to you that I can. If I were to date you, there'd be no dating. It would be something right away, and I'm not that guy. But I'm not looking for anything something like. Maury. I'm not. And honestly, as someone who is polyamorous and has been in open relationships, it's a kind of very clear candor that is actually a very mature thing to do. After a while, realizing that being casual isn't for her, which is valid, and realizing in episode But I'm a Gilmore that he does have real feelings for Rory, the two decide to have an exclusive loving relationship. Boy, you came in here to say you're unhappy with the situation, right? Right. Fine, I've rectified the situation, problem solved. No, problem not solved. Hey, if I say I can do this, I can do this. This is also the episode where we see how tightly Rory is attached to who she is through the lens of high society. But why don't they think I'm good enough? Rory. I mean, I'm a Gilmore, do they know that? My ancestors came over on the Mayflower. For most of the show, Rory has never had to fight consistently for anything. Even her rivalry with Paris over Harvard ended with her being victorious, even though Paris a thousand percent worked harder than her because Paris was ultimately punished for having sex. I've got the good kid. <laughs> and that's fucked up and everyone knows it. In her romantic relationships, both Dean and Jess were obsessed with her from the jump. So as audience members who have been following Rory through the show, when she's crying over Logan in To Live and Let Diorama, it's heartbreaking because we know she cares a lot about him. But she also agreed to be in a no strings attached relationship and he took her at her word. I don't think Rory is wrong for feeling sad and let down because someone you love doesn't love you back the same way, that is a very, very human emotion. However, we also have to understand that for Logan, he has admitted that he's never been in a real relationship and he is acting in a way that he feels is fair because of the expectations he brought in to their relationship. It was also a very weird time in the 90s and 2000s where we kept telling young women that if they just keep staying with a guy in a casual situation, eventually he will want a relationship with you. This is not real. Take it from someone who knows, I who. What is significant about this relationship is that when Rory does express how she feels, he responds positively. He answers the call to be her boyfriend because that's what he wants to do if the choice is them being together or not. Thing with you and Logan. Oh yeah? When Logan said you two broke up, I almost threw a lamp at him. Oh. Moron. He's his own worst enemy. He told you that we broke up? Here, I'm guaranteed to run into at least three times a day, your usual. You've been hanging out at this coffee cart every day for a week. Yes, it's sad. I'm officially a wuss. If I saw me doing this, I'd beat the crap out of myself. You have nothing better to do with your time? Nothing better than to try and get you back? No. Nope. You're too slick for your own good, Huntsberger. Excuse me, but this is not slick. This is a Nora Ephron movie. Louis Armstrong should be warbling as we talk, so come on, please, put me out of my misery. The most notable thing about the Rory Logan relationship is that he treats her like an adult like an equal. He trusts her to speak her mind and make her own decisions. The problem is that Rory often doesn't know what she wants because for most of her life, she lived without serious 
challenges to her personality because she got to just be banally excellent. A lot of blame gets put on Logan for Rory's bad choices because he doesn't hold her hand into situations with the advice of a wise sage. Rory is an adult. She makes her own choices. It's not Logan's responsibility to be her caretaker, especially when they just start dating. And there are some who claim that Rory's attraction to Logan has to do with daddy issues over her distant father, Christopher. But I think that underplays all the people involved. Christopher and Logan are both good looking rich kids who stifle under their father, but that's pretty much where the comparisons end. Logan has always tried to rise to the occasion when it comes to Rory's feelings, and Christopher is honestly so underwritten that he's supposed to be both a distant father, but also involved in a way in his daughter's life that is consistent. So it's always, which one is it? And when it also comes to Logan, I think the most notable thing about him is that he pushes back and challenges Rory about her own class privileges, whereas other people kind of think that she's classless. One of the really interesting things about when she and Logan go through a hard point and she ends up reuniting with Jess is him saying, we used to make fun of people like this when it comes to Logan, but Rory is also a rich kid. She went to Cotillion. As she reminds everybody, she's a Gilmore. Her family came over at the, in the Mayflower. That's who she is. I'm a Gilmore, do they know that? My ancestors came over on the Mayflower. Don't try and analyze it, there's no rhyme or reason. Certainly Rory is a hard worker, but she cannot imagine a world in which her hard work does not carry with it a hefty reward. To a certain degree, viewers may be meant to judge Rory here, to see her behavior as problematic. I would argue that while that is the case, if that was true, people would not have been as surprised as they were in A Year in the Life to see Rory be so terrible at everything because that was who she was. One of my favorite moments for the couple is in introducing Lorelai Planetarium, where Rory writes this judgmental piece about the launch party of Logan's new internet company. He is hurt because he feels she is talking about him negatively and mocking his accomplishments despite having the same highbrow background. This was meant to be funny. I didn't think you would take it personally. I mean, you're totally different from these people. No, I'm not. You know what? I don't want to be. Logan. What? I'm a rich trust fund kid. I'm not ashamed of it. No, and you shouldn't be. That That's not what I meant. I mean, my point, or the point I was trying to make was that people use connections to get ahead. Oh, give me a break. You act like making connections is something nefarious. It's not. It's just people meeting people. Well, it's certain people meeting certain people. It's not like anyone's meeting Joe Bus Driver. And you're Joe Bus Driver. Well, no, Exactly. But... I mean, where do you get off acting all morally superior? That is not what I intended to say at all. You clearly think you are. Why? Because you read Ironweed? Because you saw Norma Ray? Logan. Wake up, Rory. Whether you like it or not, you're one of us. <laughs> you went to prep school. You go to Yale. Your grandparents are building a whole damn astronomy building in your name. That is different, okay? It's not like I live off a $5 million trust fund my parents set up for me. Yeah, well, you're not exactly paying rent either. They eventually reconcile in this scene and have an adult conversation. But I think the point that is being made here by Logan is very much valid. We should address more deeply the giant class size elephant in the room. The Gilmore Girls is a show that is concerned about class, kinda. It wants to pepper throughout the narrative all the signifiers of class disparity, but cannot commit to actually sitting with the reality of how hard it is for a single mother to raise a child in a middle class environment. My mother wasn't a single mother, but we were a single income household, and she basically killed herself putting my brother and myself through college, and for him going into an exclusive prep school. In a single episode, they will be lamenting about paying for college and then planning a backpacking trip through Europe, which is an expensive thing to do. Mom, why put it off? I mean, I know the independence in closing is a setback. Big one. But we've got the rest of Grandpa's money. That's plenty to buy the Dragonfly in. And we'll just scrimp on everything until it's all up and running and successful. It would take a lot of scrimping. Well, I'm a master scrimper. I would make the Olympic scrimping team. I'm that good boy. Honey, we didn't get financial aid for Yale. What? No scholarships, no hardship money, no money off coupons, no gift certificates, nothing. I don't understand. What happened? Well, irony of ironies, the money I got from your grandpa uh, took us out of the running for financial aid because it made it look like we have money. Hey, what happened to our packing elves? We're going to pack our packs overnight. How about this? You hate the dress I made you that much? Not for graduation for Europe. According to savvy backpackers, quote, most frugal minded, hostile hopping backpackers spend around 70 to 100 a day in Western Europe and 40 to 80 a day in Eastern Europe. 
That is a lot of money for an entire summer, especially when you are allegedly a strap for cash family, eat out every day and don't have Luke or your grandma there to bail you out every time. They do not live the kind of lifestyle that the narrative wants us to believe. Not when they eat out so much with takeout, not when they live in an expensive suburb, not when Rory doesn't have a work study, not when they have a massive house constantly in need of some kind of repair, and when Laura like wants to buy a dilapidated inn and pay to refurnish it. In contrast with the Gilmore Mansion, Lorelai and Rory live in a two bedroom household that Emily routinely criticizes. Although humble by comparison, it is hardly the picture of dispoverishment. Inside it lacks no amenities, even if it is smaller, disorganized, and considerably more colorful. It is not a definitive picture of a working class home from, for example, married with children or Roseanne. There are nonetheless a few subtle references to challenges that Lorelai overcame while furnishing her house that remind viewers of her financial limitations, including brief mention of a secondhand bedroom set and a couch purchased on credit and paid for over many months. These moments of flirtation with the working class identity, however, are quickly obscured by a neoliberal middle class image of personal freedom. For example, when Lorelai and her on-again, off-again boyfriend contemplate purchasing a nearby mansion, she opts not to, not because she lacks the funds or credit, but because of her sentimental attachment to her home. I mean, they always plan for Rory to get a scholarship to college, but she doesn't qualify for one. She is literally rich. She does not need a scholarship. And right now, considering that we are dealing with Asian Americans being made weapons in the affirmative action conversation, that we had an entire show in which one character who came from exceptionally rich family alumni wanted to get an academic scholarship for a college like, you're a rich white girl from New Hartford, Connecticut. I just received this letter saying that my daughter did not qualify for financial aid. Rory Gilmore? Okay, yes, we did recently receive $75,000, but um, here's the thing. That money is gone. I gave it to my parents, so I don't have it anymore. Yes, but... It's since I don't have the money anymore, it just seems like it shouldn't count. There must be something we can do. I mean, Rory is the most deserving kid there is. It's just seriously. I like, why are you thinking that you qualify for a financial academic scholarship? It's, it's bizarre. It's peak whiteness. Both Lorelai and Rory have consistent access to financial assistance anytime they need it. Both borrow money from Lorelai's wealthy parents at different times to fund Rory's education. Lorelai uses funds from an investment her father made when she was born in order to purchase her own inn during the third season and borrows money from Luke Danes, the local diner owner, when her funding runs out. And Rory's ultimately released from her grandparents' loan in the final season of the show when her father suddenly reappears having inherited a fortune from a generous relative. The series thus promotes a notion that hard work leads to financial, commercial, and academic success while eluding the social factors that enable upward mobility. In her words, Lorelai's, I work my way up, I run the place now. I built a life on my own with no help from anyone. The narrative's last in time conceals the type of labor involved in this process. In fact, audiences never actually see Lorelai labor as a maid. They do not see the struggle, challenges, or humiliations that normally characterize service work. Instead, Lorelai epitomizes the neoliberal entrepreneur whose independent hard work and determination are rewarded by upward mobility. It is a familiar narrative from a series like The Cosby Show that perpetuates a fantasy of upward mobility by highlighting an exceptional case in which structural barriers were overcome by a deserving protagonist. And the way audiences are sold this is by the signs of class struggle. Ferdinand de Saussure is one of the fathers of linguistics, and he came up with the concept of the sign. In semiotics, a sign is anything that communicates a meaning that is not the sign itself to the interpreter of the sign. This is broken down into two components of the sign and the signifier, with the signifier being the object that brings to mind the item, basically symbolic shorthand. For an example, that everyone kind of knows Star Wars. Uh, Dark Vader's outfit, the black chrome, inhuman look versus Princess Leia's white dress. Before you know anything about Leia, her entire outfit tells you she is good. She is clearly human. You can see her as a person. Vader's black uniform signifies darkness and evil, but he's also dehumanized by his mask. The stormtroopers are also uniform, faceless beings, so that even though they are dressed in white, the 
the symbolic nature of the design tells you, tells your brain that these are the bad guys, that the white of their outfits is meant to symbolize almost a cult-like aesthetic, not goodness. This happens with class in the show as well. We are told that there's a sharp cultural division between Lorelai and her rich family when they have a lot in common. Lorelai is able to take her class privileges and transfer that onto Rory. They live like the mythical princesses in Stars Hollow because they have this charm. That charm is the remnants of their class privileges that comes through in their education. One of the most irritating things about the way Lorelai dislikes Logan is that more than any of the other boys that Rory has dated, Logan most resembles Lorelai, a person from privilege who was smothered under the weight of a wealthy, rich white family. Yet Lorelai extends zero grace to him. She is worried about Logan's influence on Rory when no one made Rory cheat with Dean, no one made her drop out of Yale. Lorelai has ignored that by allowing Emily, Richard, Luke, etc. to bail them out of financial difficulties time after time when it counted, while only symbolically trying to keep the signifiers of working class mobility, she has not actually prepared Rory for the real world. She is sheltered, and that sheltering has an effect. The fear Lorelai has over outside influences corrupting Rory speaks more to Rory's failures as a person than her partner's negative influences. We also got to see Rory really be her own person in college, and that person sucked, but it felt like a natural organic evolution for a character who was defined by her perfection. Logan never treated Rory like she was perfect, and that might sound shady, but I think that's the only way you can have a real relationship with someone. I always felt, even upon rewatching, that Jess and Dean treated Rory like a prize to be won. I remember Dean being sad and talking about Rory the same way she sadly drunkenly cried over Logan. Logan saw Rory as a person, a person he loved, a person he respected, but he also had his own growing up to do and he didn't need to step on her to do it. And I think that's really important. Logan is the only boyfriend that actually develops and becomes a better person throughout the relationship where the other two just devolve and the little bit of hiccups in their relationship are mostly about communication flaws. To address the infamous Bride's Head Revisited episode where Rory finds out that Logan slept with his sister's friends when they took a break, first of all those girls were dead ass vile for saying that stuff. I mean when one of the girls goes you are Rory Rory and drops the R word you know she's vile but it's like Rory's not a common name how many Rory's do you know? And also the fact that the conversation continues is gross. Should Logan have warned Rory about this? Should he have slept with these girls? I'm of two minds about it. I feel that if Logan generally thought that they were separated and did not know what was going on, then he thought they were on a break, then he in good faith had the freedom to sleep with whomever he wanted to and Rory would have the same freedom. They should have had a conversation about this when they got back together for no other reason than to just make sure that they both got tested for STI because, you know, if you're going to be in a monogamous relationship after taking a break, you should at least know if you both have the same sexual health history. But because this is television and no one has no conversations, that didn't happen. And I think they were both not really great at being communicators because this was the first time Rory was with somebody who had a much broader sexual history than her. And that can be very overwhelming when you are young and inexperienced. And that's not her fault, that's not his fault. It's about communication and how important that is in a relationship. I will say this though, if you are on a break, like a real break, not a two second Ross break, then you are on a break. I just would not expect that if my girlfriend is a member of a bridal party with full grown adult women, especially ones that are bridesmaids for my sister, that they would not be talking about how they had sex with me. That's really bonkers to me. And I think that, yes, they should have had a conversation. But I also think it's weird to stigmatize people for having consensual sex when they are on a break if they're being responsible. Because the only real obligation they have is to be responsible with their bodies, which it seems they did. So it's always been one of those things where, like, I get it from an emotional standpoint, like, the whole we were on a break discourse is, is something that they like to do again in the in the 90s and the aughts. But I just feel like it's a communication flaw. Monogamy is not the only valid form of being in a relationship. And if you're not together, 
you're allowed to have sex with other people. The relationship comes to an end in season seven when Logan proposes to Rory, but she turns him down and decides to work for Barack Obama's campaign, which good, good call on that one. So we were just talking about different opportunities that might come up and where I've already applied. And he mentioned that the reporter that was covering the Barack Obama campaign for him dropped out because his fiance got a job in Dubai, so they're moving. Wow. So then Hugo asked me if that was something I'd be interested in. And I said, yes, I would be interested. And he told me more about it. And apparently I would be on the campaign trail with the other reporters, the planes, the buses, the whole deal. And I mean, it's only an online magazine, so I wouldn't be staying where the Wall Street Journal people stay at night, but. Who cares? But I would be traveling with them. I'd be filing stories from the road right up until the convention. Oh, so have you talked salary yet? Yeah, it's next to nothing, but all my meals and travel and hotels would be covered, so I wouldn't have that many expenses. Well, that's fine. You're just starting out. Plus, it sounds like you'll be making excellent contacts. I would be. And they end on a sad but perfectly fine note. They had a couple of bumps along the way, but they'd really become a pretty solid working couple that dealt with long distance, dealt with communication issues, dealt with having to live together for a while. They had a mature adult relationship and it ended because they were in different emotional places and that happens. Then the spinoff happened. For months now, I've been skulking around, not saying anything, not having an opinion on anything, like I'm Clarence Thomas or something, and I, 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 I'm done with that. Besides my wonderful video where I rant about this topic, to understand the mess of a year in the life, you need to understand the merger. What if a debt doesn't go for the merger? Urge her. In 2006, the WB merged with UPN to form a new network, the CW and remove tons of black shows to pivot to whiteness as they have been doing ever since and probably will do again now that another merger has killed many a show on the CW network. Gilmore Girls survived the merger being accepted as one of the seven shows that the WB transferred for a new season along with Charmed, Supernatural, Veronica Mars, Everyone Hates Chris, Beauty and the Geek, and America's Next Top Model. Really stroke in the bottom of the barrel at those last two picks. In April of that year, it was announced that Amy Sherman Palladino and her husband, Daniel Palladino, could not come to an agreement with the CW and would be leaving the show when their contract expired. Journalist Michael Alcino said of the decision, the thought of Gilmore Girls heading into what is likely to be its final season and its first on a brand new network without its mama or her right hand man is unfathomable. Later on, Sherman Palladino reflected on the contract dispute in an interview with Vulture saying, it was a botched negotiation. It was really about the fact that I was working too much. I was going to be the crazy person who was locked in my house and never came out. I heard a lot of Amy doesn't need a writing staff because she and Daniel Palladino write everything. I thought that's a great mentality on your part, but if you want to keep the writers going for two more years, let me hire more writers. By the way, all the show we asked for, they had to do it anyway when we left. They hired this big writing staff and a producer director on stage. That's what bugged me the most. They wound up doing what we asked for anyway, and I wasn't there. David S. Rosenthal, who worked on the show as a writer and producer for season six, was selected by Sherman Palladino to replace her as showrunner. A lot of people have therefore treated the seventh season as some weird non-canon season. Except the foundation for a lot of stuff that happened already takes place in season six. Luke's annoying daughter, April, season six. Lorelai going back to the arms and comfort of Christopher at the dramatic fight with Luke, season six. Logan and Rory being together, but with a long distance element being brought into the relationship, but them overall being in love, season six. There is really nothing in season seven that is so terrible, it needed to be retconned away. Do people not like that Lorelai and Christopher got married? Hell, I shipped it and I don't think it was a perfectly executed thing, mostly because they broke up for bullshit reasons, because they were too powerful and clearly belonged together. But you know, when, when there's a court mandated OTP, who cares about chemistry? But yeah, was it awkward at times? Yes. Is it usually worse than season six? Not really. I mean, it's a lot of the same kind of bullshit. And once you watch Mrs. Maisel, you kind of see that an extra season wouldn't have really made a big difference. Now, I know that's a very controversial opinion and I look forward to reading y'all opposition, but I said what I said. In a year in the life, we see that Logan and Rory are having an affair. 
it's called an affair because Rory, once again, is cheating and dating somebody else at the time. And Logan is engaged to some random girl and working for his father. Again. The most important part of Logan's arc during the seventh season was him breaking away from his dad and starting his own company. To pretend like that never happened means we have to believe that this character is starting off backwards, that we are reviving his character, bringing him back to the present day, and he has made a huge step backwards. Why? 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 So that Rory can have a similar development with Jess that Luke has with Lorelai, even though they're step family. They wanna do the whole, Rory has a baby with the handsome rich boy, Logan, and ends up falling in love with the working class stiff Jess that tried to assault her that one time. Stop it, you're spoiling it, you're spoiling everything! It's so absurd and it's been like, oh, that's what they're trying to do, it's, a, it's like a parallel. It's not a parallel. It's literally the same thing doing it again. It's silly, it's it's ridiculous, and I don't think it's a good idea. It does a disservice to everybody. Like, Rory should be on birth control. She's a grown ass white woman from Connecticut. She's on birth control, okay? Like, I don't understand, it's... <sighs> Plus the idea that Logan would abandon Rory and their baby is so deeply, truly out of character. Logan loves Rory and has been consistently making amends for his mistakes. He wanted to marry her, not the other way around. He constantly met her expectations when they were set. So the idea that it is okay to just karate chop his character development because you didn't write the seventh season is just really bad. It is reductive character writing and it's terrible. But considering the fat phobia, can we really be surprised that they would make such terrible choices? It's a giant cascading debacle. Belly alert. Holy moly. And if the point of the activity is to cool off by being in water... I like where you're going with this. Then why don't they just stay home? And take a bath. Right? <laughs> the logic's impeccable. Oh my god, just go naked. I know a lot of this ended up being a lot of discussion about class and the politics of the show, but I think that's a big part of why I like Logan. Logan is a good foil for the protagonist of the show, both Rory and Lorelai. He challenges them in terms of what they stand for. He has all of the makings of a great partner for Rory, but does not fit comfortably in one world or the other. One of the big things you will see is that with each partner that comes up, they will not fit in with one world or the other. Whereas Logan actually has the ability to fit into all, but is forced into this weird dynamic with Lorelai because Lorelai thinks that Rory is moving too fast and I'm just like, okay, sure, but I don't really think you have any valid reasons to not like him. There's one very funny moment where she's talking to Logan and he's basically explaining the current digital economy and she's looking at him like he's a, he's like, like he's a dickhead and I'm like, this white boy is spitting, girl. Like he's giving you some 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 important information. Um, but Rory said you're working on some new ideas. How's that going? Great, really great. It's an exciting time. I mean, this is the real dot com renaissance. Everything's changing from the way media is sourced to the way we buy things to what we buy. All the restrictions of the brick and mortar retail model are going to be a thing of the past. Hmm. Oh yeah, it's way beyond Amazon and eBay now. It's it's kind of like what's going on with these simulation games like Second Life or World of Warcraft. Actual currency is being exchanged for virtual goods. Oh yeah? I mean, theoretically, I could make a fortune selling virtual lightsabers or something on EverQuest 2. Whatever happened to selling encyclopedias? It really just highlights to me the big flaw that shows can get when they make everything so protagonist centric morally. We're supposed to side with Lorelai and Rory in almost every situation, even when they are very, very wrong. And I think the part of Logan that was the most interesting is that he often had a point. Jess had points, Dean had points, but Logan didn't just have points, but he also managed to be a solid boyfriend. He got better, he developed, he matured, he evolved as a character. He didn't just drag Rory into the gutter, he also encouraged her and pushed her when needed and wanted her to make risky decisions. He also didn't try and like treat her like a baby. Maybe Rory needed to steal a yacht. Maybe she needed that just for herself. Logan is, 
a lot to me like Mr. Big on Sex in the City, which I know is problematic, but let me finish. Let me finish. This is ignoring the allegation against Chris Noth because that's not what I mean. What makes Big great to me as a love interest for Carrie is that he tells us a lot about the protagonist and their values. And Logan is the same way. When we see Logan interact with Lorelai and we see him interact with Rory, we can see the failures of the class dynamic that is being presented to us. He makes the narrative richer. And to me, if we're going to have relationships on shows, especially shows like this, they have to be ones that help fill out the broader color background of the show and this does that this relationship is solid and also they have really great chemistry they they really vibe together I really I have rewatched this series three times gonna do it another time with my with my partner and I always want to feel differently I always want to be like well maybe this time I'll like Jess and then he crosses the bridge. I like Dean more than I like Jess. I just feel like Logan is above them all because I think relationships are hard. I think relationships are imperfect. Communication is a big part of it. And I like seeing a relationship between two people where what makes them stronger is their ability to talk to each other. He's the only partner who can really do that with Rory. And while he may call her ace and while he may be a bit of a smug asshole, the Gilmores are smug assholes, so I think he fits right in. So anyway, that's why I'm Team Logan. Um, let me know uh, what team you're on. I mean, obviously I'm Team Paris and then also Team No One because Rory is awful, but Logan is my favorite. And I, I don't want to get into real things about why I love Christopher, but I love Christopher as well. I hate Luke. Luke is a man child. He tried to fight a teenager and I'm like, where's, where's that energy for uh, your boy Jess when he tried to assault Rory? What's wrong? You were looking forward to this party. What happened? Awesome. Something did. Come on, tell me. You're not tired of me, are you? That's a pretty good answer. Just wait. Just hmm. wait. Just. Jeez. Not here, not now. Fine. What's wrong with you? Nothing is wrong with me. Someone could walk in that door. And Santa Claus could come down the chimney, whatever. You did not think that it was going to happen like this, did you? I don't know what I think anymore. Jess. Rory, stop, just stop. I did not invite you up here. You came up here on your own. I, I don't know what I did. I hate Luke. Uh, Team Emily, even though she's a terrible person, but I love her and she knows she's a pain. Um, the best look that Rory had was definitely the early seasons because in the later seasons, her bangs are too long. I cannot, I cannot approve of that. But I would say Gilmore Girls is leaps and bounds better than Mrs. Maisel. And it sucks that Mrs. Mabel gets to be like her big reward fodder show because I think that Lauren Graham deserves all of that. So that's all i hope there's no second season of a year in the life because no one needs that even though Lisa bladell has left a handmaid's tale but she got her meb free sis um we stand a white latina queen I will fight.